So again, welcome everybody, we're happy to have you. And let me just get started with introducing our speaker today, our reader. We have with us Dr. Lino Davis. And Lino started birding when he was a student working on a, the Kirtland's Warbler Project in the Bahamas, and this was in 2001. So he was an undergraduate student and he, he volunteered to work on a research project and then ended up getting his PhD in biology and conservation. And uh, he is a great naturalist and great educator. He has two little kids himself. And so we're really happy to have Lino with us today. So Lino, say a quick hello before we get started with the um, story time. Hello, everyone. It's great to see you kind of uh, on Zoom and on Facebook. And today I am speaking to you from a wetland here. This is a mangrove wetland. And we're going to be reading one of my favorite books, The Sea, the Storm, and the Mangrove Tangle. And I hope you all enjoy it very much. And we're going to talk about a little bit of what I can find here, right in this vicinity, as soon as the book reading is done. So I hope everyone's ready. Get comfortable. Get a little drink of water. And we're going to start right now. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Lino. So we'll um, be chatting with you. The kids will have a chance to ask you some questions after the story time reading. So let's get going. We have a book called The Sea, The Storm, and The Mangrove Tangle. I think you're going to like it. Here we go, Lino. The Sea, The Storm, and The Mangrove Tangle by Lynn Cherry. Some people say the sun shines equally on the whole world, but sometimes we have to wait our turn. Likewise, the animals and plants that we see in this book may not all occur at the same time in the same place anywhere in the Caribbean, but they can be found throughout the islands that we call home. Let's begin. Over a shallow, salty, tropical sea, a flock of pelicans flew around a mangrove island. From the branches of this tangle of mangroves dangled long, sprouting seeds called propagules. Can you see the propagules hanging from the tree? As a pelican landed, it jostled a branch and a propagule fell into the sea. For weeks, the propagule was carried by a strong current until it came to rest on the shore of a far away lagoon. There, it took root and sprouted leaves and began to grow. For decades in the hot Caribbean sun, as tides rose and fell, it slowly grew and grew and sent out prop roots to help it stand. This is a particular type of mangrove. It uses prop roots that stick out from the side of the main root to help prop it up. That's why they call them prop roots. Can you see the prop roots on the tree on the far right? By its 50th year, its vast network of roots anchored the little mangrove tree, allowing it to survive storms. It was now quite a distinctive tree. A mangrove tree crab scuttled by and exclaimed, how can a tree grow in this salty sea? She climbed the seedling to eat its leaves and made the mangrove her home. Mangrove oysters, sea anemones, and a coral settled on the roots. Small fiddler crabs dashed and darted about below the high tide line and disappeared into the holes under the mangrove's roots. A periwinkle tree snail came upon the mangrove seedling and thought, I can eat the algae that grows on these roots. So it stayed on to live there. Mangrove leaves fell into the water. They decomposed and turned into muck. In this muck, the seagrass began to grow. Several more years passed and the mangrove tree became larger, sending out more branches and prop roots. It grew flowers that were pollinated by the wind. 
Some of the flowers look like the hummingbirds are trying to help pollinate them as well. What other organisms do you see here? I see a butterfly. The bird all the way in the back is a black neck stilt. And then there is an adult yellow crowned night heron feeding a baby yellow crowned night heron. Driftwood floating across the sea carried an old lizards to the mangrove tree. We can eat the ants, mosquitoes, and other insects that crawl and fly over these flowers, they thought. Hummingbirds hid their nests within the mangrove's tangled branches, while a caterpillar and the mangrove tree crab nibbled on its leaves. After the mangrove flowers dropped their petals, propagules formed. These living seeds grew long and heavy until they fell down between the mangrove roots into the seagrass. There, the new propagules began to grow. A seahorse carried his babies in a pouch on his belly. Here is a good place for my babies to hide, he thought, and gently released them into the seagrass bed. Mama shrimp and fish laid their eggs there. Grunts and mangrove snappers fed in the seagrass at night, and during the day, they hid from bigger fish among the mangrove roots. The propagules grew into many mangroves. For 70 years, this mangrove tangle grew and spread out farther and farther. Dolphins found the water around the mangroves, teeming with fish, and decided to stay there. Manatees came to feed in the seagrass, and they too made the waters around the mangroves their home. What other animals do you see eating seagrass? There, in the bottom, it's a turtle. Turtles really enjoy eating seagrass as well. A hundred years had passed since the first propagule planted itself here, and the mangrove tangle had become a big mangrove island. As a flock of pelicans dove for fish, two fishermen came by, and one said, let's cut these mangroves down and create a shrimp farm. The other fisherman replied, but these mangroves are the only trees that grow in the salty seawater. Many of the fish in the ocean start their lives in nurseries around these mangrove islands. If we destroy the mangroves, we destroy the fish which give us all life. And so they went out to sea and left the island in peace. Two pelicans tucked themselves into the mangroves and thought, here we can build a nest and die for fish. Herons came to hunt for shrimp, crabs, and small fish. Magnificent frigate birds puffed up their large red pouches to impress their mates. One afternoon, a pelican flew to the mangrove island breathlessly. She cautioned, Beware! Prepare! A storm brews! A wild wind blows this way! She called to the creatures of the air, Come hide deep within the tangled branches of the mangroves! The manatees lifted their noses in the air and sniffed. Yes, there was that sweet, damp scent of rain. On the horizon, they saw far away plumes of rain descending from a raft of dark clouds. A hurricane was on its way. The seahorses called to the other creatures of the sea, Come with us! Beneath the roots in the center of the mangrove, we will be safe! So they swam, crawled, scurried, and slithered into the shelter of the mangrove roots. That evening, the breeze became a screaming tempest. Thick, dark, frothing clouds raced across the sky. The hurricane is here, the animals cried. Winds sang and moaned through the mangrove tangle, lashing, breaking, and tearing branches. The birds held on, fighting the power of the hurricane throughout the night. Under the sea, the sand churned as huge waves tossed and turned the fish and the seahorses, trying to rip the mangrove roots from their hold on the sea floor. 
The next morning, all was still. The sun shone from behind retreating purple clouds, and a mangrove propagule floated away on the current. The birds came out from the safety of the mangrove's damaged branches. The periwinkle tree snails timidly peeked out from their shells and looked around. The fish, the crabs, and the seahorses swam out from the protection of the mangrove roots. All were safe. Meanwhile, the mangrove propagule, blown by the storm, came to rest on the shore of a faraway lagoon. Ten years have passed. Dead, bleached branches tell the story of the hurricane, but new growth has sprouted from the mangrove's broken branches, and the mangrove island is even bigger, wider, and deeper. Now, while pelicans dry their feathers, and dolphins jump, roll, and play in the waves, and manatees lazily loll in their seagrass bed, while a heron hunts in the shallows and a hawk screeches, that mangrove propagule, carried on the waves to a faraway lagoon, has now grown into a little mangrove tree. And there it will continue to grow, and grow, and grow. Now that is the end of our story for today, but the story of the mangroves keeps going. Just like in our story, mangroves are battered by storms, but they protect birds and animals that live inside them. But they also protect us too. They keep really strong winds and waves from getting to our homes on land, and they prevent our land being washed into the sea. If you would like to learn more about volunteering to help mangroves and other wildlife in the Bahamas, you can find me at Psy Perspective on social media. And if you would like to learn more about birds and connect with scientists throughout the Caribbean that protect birds and their habitat, you can contact us at Birds Caribbean on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Thank you for joining us. Okay, did everyone enjoy the story? Yes, we did. Let's go start on la historia. Thanks. Je ne parle français, but did you guys all enjoy it? Yes, we I'm did. I'm really glad. Yep. Now, oh, the story is called The Sea, The Storm, and The Mangrove Tangle, if you want to look it up. It is available on Amazon, and you can switch your Amazon smile to support Birds Caribbean if you'd like. Now, right now, I would like to show you all where I am. So this beautiful mangrove wetland is in Adelaide. It's on the western side of New Providence in the Bahamas. And here, this guy flying by, that's a green heron. And while we were doing the story, I was watching it and it's actually building a nest in that tree over there. So it's gonna come back and forth uh, pretty much all day as it's just picking up little sticks and building that nest. Isn't that awesome? It must have just planned it just for this day. And here, this bird that's coming across, that's a gray kingbird. And the gray kingbirds are just coming into the Bahamas over these past few months during the corona, corona apocalypse. Um, they are here visiting and making their nests. And they're one of the bird species that just visit temporarily before they uh, leave to go to other places to feed for the rest of the year. Now, what I am going to do is show you some of the mangroves that you just saw inside that story. And I'm going to give you a little bit more of the information related to them and their biology and their habit. So we're gonna start with the star of the story. This is a red mangrove. 
and they call it red mangroves because if you look at the roots, they actually have a little reddish hue on them. All of these roots, they kind of get reddish as they get bigger. But also, many of the leaves, they have sacrificial leaves. So, when they've had enough salt, they can pump that salt into one of these leaves and then you just let it fall. When that, leaves fall. when that leaf falls down into the soil, it makes that muck that we spoke about in the story, but lots of little animals and critters live down inside that muck. And that can be really deep. If you step in there, you lose your flip-flops and it smells really healthy. <laughs> It, it has a really, really strong smell. But the muck down there collects all the dead decomposing leaves. It's very nutrient rich. And now I am, I'm a little stuck inside this uh, mangrove tangle right now. So I'm going to try to disentangle myself. <laughs> very cool, Lino. Do you have any propagule right. on, that, on that mangrove? Yes, but I, I have to climb up a little bit higher to get to them. Okay, cool. All right. So here we go. These are some itty bitty bitty little propagules. Look at those. So one of the cool things about mangroves is they take care of their babies. So after these flowers are pollinated, the seed actually starts growing on the tree. And it grows into a little propagule that can then go and float around like we saw inside the story. And it has basically everything that it needs to settle down and become a tree. Now, I'm going to show you one that is about to get connected. This is, a, this is an adventure. Urgh. <laughs> don't get stuck, Dr. Lino. We don't have anybody to come pull you out of the muck. This is actually one of the safest um, ways to do an adventure right now. So check this out. It's a propagule. So, so the propagules pretty much look like a stick. Um, and I have, I have some bug that's bothering me. Um, so once the bottom of it touches the, touches the soil or the muck here inside the mangrove wetland, it starts growing out roots. And these smaller roots anchor it first and then as it gets taller and taller, it puts out more of those, propagule, those prop roots that will help to keep it supported. So now I am going to push this down into the muck so you can know that this little propagule will be safe. Awesome. Are we gonna give it a name? What do we name that propagule? Let's name it George. Mm -hmm. George the propagule, okay. Oh. All right, everyone, so I'm back out. There are two mockingbirds over there fighting. And lots of different birds just love this area. I've seen Antillean nighthawks, the mockingbirds up there, they're fighting, and they're probably establishing territories and saying who's the best mockingbird of all. Um, we have the Antillean nighthawks, I really love them. And you'll often see them just sitting down in an area like this because they don't really make a nest. They just put their egg on the ground. Um, oh, winded. <laughs> now, unfortunately, this area used to be mangrove wetland, but human beings have cleared the mangroves and then put down this fill. And that's really not good because the mangrove area will have tons of different plant species as well as the algae and all of that stuff inside it. And that brings all the different animals. And those animals include crabs, fish, conch. Now our Caribbean people, do you know what this is? This is a conch shell. And this is specifically the queen conch. And in the Bahamas, we eat lots of conch, but we need marine systems 
like the uh, mangrove areas and the seagrass beds that we talked about so that the conch can be healthy. I'm going to rest this shell right here back in the mangrove wetland where I found it. Um, but some things we don't want to leave where we found them. So here today, there are lots of different types of bottles. So different types of glass bottles. And some of these, maybe people threw them right into the mangrove wetland, but a lot of these may come from the sea. So the ocean, when people have things drop off of a ship or even if someone throws something in the ocean somewhere else in the world, it can end up floating over to us because the islands of the Bahamas are shallow and surrounded by water. We have a lot of um, coastal area that's exposed to the water and that smells right. Uh, <laughs> inside this, the, the really bad thing about glass bottles and plastic bottles is that little organisms, they may smell all that yucky muck inside there and they say, oh, that smells delicious. And they get inside there to try to find something to eat, but then they can never get back out. So it basically continues to trap and kill lots, of, lots and lots of little organisms over the years. And this, these glass bottles don't break down, so they can continue killing for decades. Right. Here is another species of plant and I'm gonna pick that bottle up later. Uh, this is another species of plant called a buttonwood, and it's actually in a group of plants that they basically call them all mangroves, or when you learn about them in school, you learn about it as a mangrove group. But these ones are a little less water tolerant than the red mangroves. So the red mangroves, you can see they're actually in the water. The buttonwood grows right next to the water. One of the cool things is if you look closely at the leaves, it has two little spots on the side. That's where it lets out its salt. So the red mangrove will sacrifice an entire leaf. But these guys, they just squeeze a little bit of salt out of those salt glands. And if you want some salt in your diet, you can just lick <laughs> off of that leaf. Mm -hmm. Now, um, over here, try not to spook them, but those big holes there, those are land crab holes. And so we have land crabs. They're not as big as the coconut crabs that can split a coconut with one, with, by hitting it with their claw, but these can get pretty big. You don't want to just jam your hand down inside there because they will get you. Can you see that little one right there? Does everyone see the crab? As they get closer, it's going to move. So keep your eyes on it, okay? It's right there. I'm also trying not to get pinched. <laughs> Oh, it let me pet it. What a nice little crop. There you go. Hello, Mr. Crab. All right, you see that big claw? This is a type of fiddler crab. And usually they have one big claw that allows them to fight and show dominance against other males, but then they have a smaller claw that they use to eat because that big claw is so big that they actually can't get it to their mouth. This, this is being a pretty cool field trip. I'm having fun. <laughs> All right. Bye, Bye. Mr. Crab. All right. Now I'm gonna show you another plant. We tend to think that all plants are good and all plants share some characteristics that make them good. They do create oxygen for us. They, most plants uh, have some edible component to them. Um, 
they're pretty. I, I like pretty much all plants. I think they're attractive. But this plant here is called Scavola. If anyone's here from Hawaii, you might recognize this. This is Scavola Takata. And this is an invasive species in the Bahamas. What it does is it grows so fast that it starts to shade out all of our native plants that are around it. So these buttonwood plants that we talked about earlier are small and they take a long time to grow. Whereas this uh, Hawaiian sea grape may only have taken a few months to get to this size. These would have taken more than a year to get up like that. So I can actually pull this out. And this only takes a few months to get this big. But people brought these here because they wanted to put them in their yards and it's very easy to, to grow these and then sell them. Right now, nobody can sell them anymore because they're a trash plant uh, and they grow all over the place like a weed. This other one, this is Casuarina. So this is Casuarina. Um, we have two types of Casuarina, Casuarina folia and Casuarina glauca. So these, plants came from Australia and like and similar to the scavola they were introduced for horticulture but this casuarina tree can grow 10 feet tall in one year can you imagine if your kids grew 10 feet tall in one year your parents wouldn't be able to feed you so the same way in the Bahamas we can't take care of all of these casuarina seedlings that are popping up look they're everywhere and they're not Bahamian plants. So our Bahamian birds and lizards and stuff don't know how to use them or to eat them. Except I have found um, some common ground doves eating casuarina seeds. So eventually, eventually our birds may learn to use those different invasive species. But until they do, we have to do a really good job of pulling them out and killing them and helping our environment kind of catch up so it's not uh, too bad. But the casuarina also poisons all the trees below it. So that can be really bad. Here's another bottle. This one is kind of interesting looking to me. And another plant. Here we go. This is poison wood. So if you ever come to the Bahamas and you're gonna go on an adventure, this is one of the plants that you need to know what it looks like. The leaves can be in, in odd numbers. So one, three, five, seven. And usually, it's such a pretty little plant. It has a very light midrib and then light colored edges. It also usually has little black spots on the leaves. That is a good indication that it's poison wood and you should avoid touching it as much as possible. But the birds actually like to eat poison wood berries. So that's one of the main food plants for our white crowned pigeons, zenata doves, morning doves, and lots of other birds in the Bahamas and butterflies and bees also love the pollen. All right, everyone. Now, do we have any questions about the book or the environment or the birds that we're hearing right now? Um, yes, hi, Dr. Lino. So we do have a few questions and I will help with um, passing them on to you since I know it's difficult for you to read the chat. So one person asked, um, how do mangroves help people? Oh, in the book, we talked about the mangroves helping the animals inside the storms. And that's pretty much exactly what the mangroves do for us as human beings. So the mangroves usually grow along the coastline. And on the coastline, when big waves and strong winds come from hurricanes and storms, the mangroves slow that stuff down. And so we may still get some waves, some uh, flooding and stuff like that, but the mangroves help to reduce that energy. 
the mangrove wetland also allows the water to run into it. So when there is flooding, the mangrove wetlands catch the water and channel it back out into the ocean. But equally as important, because the hurricanes only happen once in a while, but equally as important is that we have fish and food that comes from the mangrove wetlands. So most of the fish species that live in the deep ocean, they start off as little babies that are either in mangrove wetlands, on seagrass beds, or in coral reefs. So you need all of these different habitats to work together in synergy to protect each other and to feed each other so that we can eventually get those fish and other species that we will eat in the future. Excellent, thanks. And what about the role that mangroves play in protecting us from hurricanes and storms? How does, how does that work? So it's, it's kind of like every one of those little prop roots that reduces one part of that wave. So you might have a really, really big wave. And if there is just one tree standing there or just one stem, it can hit or pass around that. But you have hundreds of thousands of little roots and stems all along the coastline. And so when that wave hits it, it basically faces an army of, of defenses that are protecting us. That's great. Yeah, I like to think of mangroves as kind of being like the skeletons in our body protect what's inside of us. The mangroves are kind of like a, a skeleton that protect the, the islands and, and the people. Okay, so we have another question. Um, Betsy is asking, what are the different species of mangrove in the Bahamas? And is it the same all over the Caribbean? So we do have uh, several species of mangroves that are not just in the Caribbean, but they're around the world. So we have red mangroves that we spoke a lot about today. We have the black mangrove and white mangrove. And then we have the buttonwood species that grow more inland, but they're still grouped along with those with the mangroves because they also protect the coastline. Now, the cool thing is that our environments are different. So the Bahamas is very shallow, low lying, and winds and uh, storm energy really batters our coastline. So a lot of our mangroves, although it's the exact same species, is very tiny, it's very short. But I've been to the Dominican Republic and some of their mangroves are like 20 feet tall. And I'm like, whoa, is this the same thing? And they're like, yeah, it's the same type of mangrove, but it's just huge. And so I, I'm really, uh, I'm always excited to see how animals and plants may behave differently if they're exposed to a different environment. And so yeah, it's the same species, but they may look slightly different depending on where you are. Even right here, this is one of the buttonwoods, like the ones that I just showed you, but you can see the leaves are slightly different. It's not as reddish in the bottom. So things like that can change depending on where you are, or where you see it. Okay, cool. Somebody else is asking, are mangroves only found in salt water? Hmm. So when you move inland in the Bahamas, our islands are so low lying that we don't really have a lot of fresh water at the surface. But in other islands where you may have rivers or mountains feeding into the into the river system and the ocean and the wetlands, you may have a gradient where down at the sea, it's really salty. And then as you go up and closer into the land, it will become more fresh water. And so you have mangroves that are maybe a little bit more used to fresh water, but for the most part, they enjoy salt water. And as you get into the freshwater wetlands, you'll have other species of plants that dominate inside that area. Right, yes, and Daniel's pointing out that um, they, some mangroves can live in brackish water, which is like a mix of salt and fresh. So good job, Daniel. And another question is, do all mangroves have prop roots? And maybe you can also then talk about pneumatophores a little bit. Maybe you can find some pneumatophores if you have any black mangrove around. I'm looking around and I think I have found some. 
but I have to go and dive into the bush. Um, but before we do that, these are some propagules um, that are much longer than the ones that I showed you before. See that? It's about Dr. Davis head length in the propagule. All right. Um, I don't know how long my head is. I can check that for y'all later. Um, but I think I see some pneumatophores. So not all mangroves have prop roots. The prop roots are specific to the red mangrove. And it holds most of the body of the plant actually up out of the water. The black mangrove does something different. What the black mangrove does is it has these rhizomes that run just below the surface of the soil, but the soil in a wetland really doesn't have a lot of oxygen in it. So they have to push up these aerial roots, these breathing roots that allow them to, to get the oxygen that they need from the air above that. So now I'm just getting ready to crawl under this bush. Um, oh, that's a crab hole. All right. All right, uh, okay. All right, so under here, these are a bunch of little uh, mangrove seedlings. And these are some aerial roots that are just poking up. And so in this area, this isn't covered in water all the time. So this is where the transition of the forest goes from red mangrove into black mangrove and then buttonwoods. And so these black mangroves have put down a bunch of seedlings, but some of the adults have their um, pneumatophores or their breathing roots coming up right in here. And this area, because it doesn't get, it doesn't stay immer immersed in water all the time, you also have lots of crab holes. So these crabs can make their burrows around here ah. and um, the top part of their burrow is dry but at the bottom they can go and get water that they need to breathe because crabs also have gills like fish all right hope that answered your little breathing root question yes excellent uh, so we have another question. Um, have you seen overfishing in mangroves? Yes. Pardon me. Stay hydrated, folks. For those of you in the Bahamas, you can support the Bahamas National Trust. They've been protecting birds and mangroves and all sorts of little critters in the Bahamas for a very long time. Now, um, the overfishing, overfishing can be a sensitive topic, especially in a time like this, when the world is going through the coronavirus pandemic and people have to find ways to feed their families because you're not making money from your traditional methods anymore. A mangrove wetland that's healthy and intact creates lots of good, healthy young fish. The problem is that we need these young fish to get out into the ocean, excuse me, to reproduce and to send their babies back and to keep the environment and the ecosystem sustainable. Now, people can come into a mangrove wetland and they may use nets or, um, big pots that catch many fish at the same time. And that's where it becomes a problem because they catch so many and it's usually more than one person or one family can eat. And then those fish never get to reproduce. And so that's what, uh, that's what, me, that's what overfishing really means. Taking more than you can use and so much that the environment cannot replace what you're taking out. And especially when we kill the, the babies before they reproduce, that becomes a problem. I'm going to try to show you a butterfly. This is a little skipper butterfly. Here. 
and it's just sitting on that little rock right there. And whenever you're trying to photograph wildlife, it's always good to start from very far away and get close, closer and closer, but very slowly. And there it is. He's so nice, he's not moving or anything. Oh, there he went. Hello. Hi. I'm giving a class. Hi. Hi. Okay. I had some guests just pass by. Cool. <laughs> All righty. Do you have any more questions? Uh, let's see. Um... Somebody was asking, can we create nurseries to create little mangrove trees and help the mangrove become bigger? That is a great question. Right now, there are lots of different groups doing lots of different initiatives to plant trees around the Bahamas and the Caribbean. Right now, the Caribbean Philanthropic Alliance is doing a million tree planting campaign or initiative and that includes 100,000 trees in the Bahamas. If you wanna find out more about that, you can contact me or you can look for Sustain Your Belly on Instagram or The Sustainable Lifestyle on Facebook. Now, as far as getting mangroves to plant them and grow them up, there are a few difficult parts about that. Firstly, is finding the mangroves and capturing the propagules or the seeds in time uh, in a safe way that you're not also uh, killing the forest because you also need enough seeds there to reproduce. And then beyond that, it's really difficult sometimes for regular people to take care of mangroves to the point that they're successful. And then you need some place to plant them back into, which often if we decide to plant mangroves somewhere, Mother Nature probably didn't put them there in the first place because that wasn't the perfect place for them. And so as we change the environment, that could cause more problems than, um, than it solves. Um, but ultimately, a really good thing that you can do is to contribute to your local conservation groups and help them to protect the areas that already have mangroves in them. And when you see development or someone planning to destroy a bunch of mangroves, speak out against it. Write letters to your, um, your political representatives, to your conservation agencies, and tell them that you know that it's not right and it's happening and you would like them to do something about it. Just like the fisherman did in the story. That's exactly right. Good job. Here, I want to show you. This is a termite mound. This is an older termite mound. So the termites have already left this, but termites actually don't eat live wood. So they're not gonna kill your living trees and stuff like that. They actually only eat the dead wood and they process it into this stuff that you have here. All right, we have another question? Yes, we do. Uh, so somebody is asking, are there ducks in the mangroves? So maybe you can tell us a little bit about the species of ducks that are in the Bahamas. Yes, we do have ducks in the mangroves. Um, every day when I, do, when I do my surveys, I typically see common gallinules, which are not ducks, but a lot of people think they're ducks because they swim in the water and they make like a squeaky sound. But I would like to pass this question off to Dr. Lisa Sorensen, who actually studied ducks in the Bahamas. Okay, thanks, Lino. Um, yes, there are lots of ducks in the mangroves and wetlands in the Bahamas and actually in, in all the islands of the Caribbean. Uh, one of the most common ducks in the Bahamas is the white-cheeked pintail or Bahama duck or Bahama pintail. And actually for my um, screen background on Zoom, you can see this duck in flight. 
Um, it's a beautiful little brown duck with a white cheek and a white throat and a red spot on the bill. And they are fairly common throughout all the islands in the Bahamas. And another really well-known duck in the Bahamas is the blue-winged teal. And this is a migratory duck. It actually breeds in the north, in the prairies way up north in um, the United States and Canada, but then it spends the winter in the Bahamas and other islands in the Caribbean. So this is a very common migratory wintering duck. And there's, there's lots of other species as well, but those are two, two of the most common ones to look out for, the blue-winged teal, and the Bahama pintail. How many of you guys have seen a blue winged teal before? Say yes in the chat window if you've seen it or if you've seen a Bahama pintail, let us know. And let us know what ducks you have in your islands. Um, the, the wetlands are great for lots of birds. You can see herons and egrets and gallinules and, and sh different kinds of shorebirds. So if you haven't been bird watching in a wetland before or a mangrove, um, go on a field trip with the Bahamas National Trust. They have monthly bird walks. And although things I think are on pause right now during the virus, um, I'm sure within a few weeks, hopefully things will start, start back up again. Um, but you can go out bird watching on your own. Just head outside and, and head to some place that has some water or even the beach and you'll find some birds to look at. Or even in your own backyard. That's right. I was trying to show you a wasp or um, hornet that was pollinating some wildflowers, some wild plants here. But I caught sight of this. This is really cool. They have really black seeds and the pith around the seed is bright red. You can see that. And their seed pods, when they open up, they curl up like a ram's horn. And that's why this tree is called ram's horn. And so people were very, um, they made very simple names back in the day. I don't remember the name of this flower, but it's very pretty and you find it throughout the wetlands. And uh, this is one of the really important features of wetlands is the biodiversity. So just sitting here, there are one, two, three, four, four species of little small herb type plants. And then you have the black mangrove, the red mangrove, poison wood, ram's horn, and then the sea grape tree. This is, this is our native sea grape tree actually, that is really good and has delicious fruit. And then this is the invasive Hawaiian sea grape tree that does not have delicious fruit and does not, is not really cool. And that is our invasive casuarina tree. So once the casuarinas take hold, they can actually kill all of these other species that we have here. Um, and so that could be really sad. But uh, do we have any other question? Uh, one last question and then we'll be ending. Uh, somebody was asking, you may have already covered this, are, are mangroves protected in the Bahamas? They are. So all species of mangroves are protected in the Bahamas. And for you to actually uproot them, dig them up, clear that land, or remove any part of them, you're supposed to get a permit from the government of the Bahamas before you can do that. Uh, unfortunately, it's really difficult to police things like this uh, in the Bahamas or anywhere in the Caribbean but especially in the Bahamas because we have 700 islands spread out all over the ocean. And so that makes it even more difficult. Um, one of the most important features of biodiverse areas like the mangroves is bush food. So these are cocoa plum and I'm collecting a bunch of these because I am going to eat them after we finish this uh, show. And I'm getting a handful right now. They're not very sweet, but they are refreshing. All right. Thank you all for joining me. This is an Adelaide mosquito on my hand. <laughs> That's funny. All right. And Lino, just one last question. What can kids do to help conserve and protect mangroves and birds? 
all over the Caribbean? What do you, what do you suggest? The first thing that you can do is educate yourself. Learn as much as you can, especially when you're younger. Learn everything that you can about all the things that interest you so that you'll be better able to explain it to other people and especially to explain it to your parents and do as much as you can to explain to your parents and tell them how great this field trip was and how much you want to engage more with Birds Caribbean and Science and Perspective. And then you can just continue to learn and take part in things. But as kids, you can often convince your parents to take you out to a wildlife area, to go on hikes, and you can even do these things in your backyard. So that's really important to know that your parents don't have to spend lots of money to do things like this. And it's a really easy way to convince them, hey, mom, do you want to spend no money and just go and walk with me in the bush? That's awesome. You can also ask your parents to download the eBird app, which will help you to identify different birds uh, anywhere in the world. The Merlin Bird ID app helps you to identify them. eBird helps you to report them so that scientists like myself and Lisa and the Birds Caribbean family can use that data and help to protect them. Uh, iNaturalist is also a good one and that will help you with other species as well, including plants and like lizards and bugs and stuff like that. But yeah, just learn as much as you can and go out on walks and hikes. Okay, well, that's awesome. Well, thanks again to Dr. Lino for spending this hour with us. And thank you to all of you for joining us. We really enjoyed having you and sharing, sharing with you about mangroves. So uh, hopefully you'll join us for another story time in the future. And in the meantime, take care, go outside, go birding, learn about the plants and animals that are all, all around you. And um, if you're in the Bahamas, go on field trips and join the Bahamas National Trust. I'm sure that every island has an organization that you can get involved in. For example, in Jamaica, National Environment and Planning Agency, Anguilla National Trust, Sustainable Gretadines Inc., lots, lots, of, lots of good organizations that are out there educating people about the wildlife that's around us and, and doing all they can to protect it. So thanks everybody again for joining us. It was fantastic to have you and we'll see you again soon. Take care. Thank you. All Bye. right. Bye everybody. Have a good day.